All right. Good morning, guys. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> Happy last week of normal class, I guess. Right. Um, yeah, today we're going to be continuing on the increase of stress, that delta sigma z. This thing. Um, and we're going to talk about one more type of loading and one more analysis technique. Um, and then on Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to uh, go over how to actually like measure this stuff in the field and then go over the exam review. Um, because if we look at our schedule, if we look at our schedule, we're almost done. May 5th, final. It's already April 26th. So it's crazy. Um, so I did update it a little bit. Uh, we're still on in-situ stress. We're not going to talk about problematic soils. We might get into a little bit of it um, uh, on the next class. But this one will also be our exam review on Thursday. Um, and then, yeah, May 5th is our exam, bright and early, 7 AM. Um, really important with this. Ooh, I can't see that color. Um, you, you guys know I'm usually pretty lenient with like testing if stuff pops up and everything. For the final, I can't. So, I mean, not, there's never been any issues here, but I just want to at least state this. You know, if you know you're going to be out, if you know there's something I should have already known by now, you know, I can't like get a text at or an email at 650 saying, you know, oh, something came up, I can't make the final. So, we have to be really strict with this because of the final. So, if you already know there's something that's going to be happening, that's a legitimate excuse that is excused, then you need to tell me like today or tomorrow so we can make adjustments for everything. Um, but you guys already know that by now. So we're good here. Uh, let's see one more, a couple other things. The solution um, to homework four has been posted. I'm going to review two of the problems today that I just saw um, uh, kind of some uh, mistakes uh, throughout the whole class. Um, lab nine is going to be due May 1st. What day is that? Sunday, that was a test for you guys. <laughs> May 1st, um, I've already seen a few submissions. Everything looks good so far. If you have any questions or, or want me to check something, um, feel free to send it over. I'd be happy to do so. Um, and then ISQs, again, there's two sections for those ISQs lab and the lecture section. Um, and I forgot to check the response rate, but hopefully it's a little bit higher. Remember, I'll do the percentage of the response rate of the class will equal the number of points um, of extra credit questions on the final. Um, and again, the final, how I grade this, the whole class is out of a point system. So it's not a percentage. Um, so, you know, like the finals is 100 points. So if you get more than 100 points, you know, those points are technically going towards your other finals or some or your other exams or something like that. Um, sorry, that was probably really confusing. But um, just just know those extra credit points go a far or go a long way for the class. Um, what else? Am I missing anything? Okay, cool. I think we're good. What was it? Is that a bad deadline? Is that wrong? Deadline, that's not right. Yeah. Probably. Does everyone get like a bunch of emails about ISQs all the time? Yes. Okay. It constantly sets you more and more. Emails. It does. Like, hey, you still have these. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. At UCF, you if you logged into your um your whatever like my wings version over there and you didn't complete them, you couldn't click on anything. It would pop up and it was it was like the ads on your phone with the super small X in the yeah. corner. Like yeah, it was like probably there was some way of exiting out, but it, they would just make it so impossible that you had to complete them. So. I don't know. I, I've never knew on this side of, you know, UNF how they do it. But anyways, let's get started. Increase in soil stress. Same areas that we're working on. The DOS textbook, um, those pages are uploaded. Um, what I'm going to do is provide those tables for you during the final. Um, it's not going to be the entire thing, but the tables we're at least covering will be printed out on your final, the ones that you need. Um, now, what you need to do, though, is make sure that you understand like what those values mean for each table, like they'll be labeled like you'll say like this will be for a point load, this will be whatever, but you're going to need to be able to recognize what the problem is asking in which table to use. The hint for that is to, to look for the units and think about the geometry, you know, 
Um, but just keep that in mind. But you you aren't going to need to print that out. You're not going to need to memorize any of that stuff. But you are going to need to at least know the the generalized formula. So what those influence factors mean. This i times that q, right? Um, and those tables are the i value. So yeah. Um, so yeah, a few people are asking about that. So you, you're not going to need to print that whole thing out. Um, it'll be like the other exams where all this information you need will be on that, that first sheet. All right, let's go over um, some of the homeworks uh, problems real quick. Number one seemed like it was pretty straightforward. Everyone, um, uh, you know, kind of did, did well on that. Um, number two, I just wanted to go through it. I'm not going to go through it entirely and show the full uh, solutions since solutions are posted. Um, but I did want to highlight two things uh, to look forward for um, in this class and in the future as well. Um, again, the if you are given a moisture content, then we need to con always consider the bulk unit weight. So we know the total stress is represented by that sigma. And uh, the way to think of this is just like everything that has mass that's above you or everything that is applying a pressure that is above you. So if this sigma represents the stress of like a dog pile, like people just laying on top of each other or whatever, the bottom of like a, a football pile or scrum or something, then like just everything that is has weight above you is going to create a stress and that stress is going to be our total stress, that sigma. So the fancy way, mathematical way of saying that is this S or the sigma, the capital sigma, the sum of uh, the unit weight times the height. But if it's also an applied pressure, then this needs to be added to it as well. So in the problem statement, it said that this uh, 2000 PSF pressure on the surface from a warehouse load is assumed to be a uniform continuous load since it's such a large surface area. So it's assumed to have the um, or to be felt or to be distributed evenly uh, with depth. So what that means is that this surcharge. So a few of the notes here. So the surcharge load of two thousand psf can technically be treated as an additional soil layer. So this means this 2000 PSF does not, um, does not diminish with depth like we've been covering in the past chapters. What this is, is it's going to be felt or it's going to, the soil is going to feel it all the way to the, like the full soil column. So, through entire depth. And so the key words to think about for this is if it is called a, a uniform or continuous loading or something like that. If you're given finite dimensions, like if you're given a footing with a size, with a geometry or something, um, then you wouldn't use this. You wouldn't be able to assume this. You would need to use the delta sigma z values that we've covered the past couple of weeks, the past couple of lectures. Um, but for this, this surcharge of 2000 PSF it can just be treated as another soil layer. Um, the other thing that we need to note for this is that capillary rise is only if stated. It's a weird way of saying that. But basically, if we have a moist soil like we do in the silty sand, but there is no indication of capillary rise, so there's no mention of an a capillary action in the problem statement, then we just assume it doesn't happen. You would have needed to be told like an HC or something in this case. You would need to told like been told how what the saturation was and how high the capillary action is. Um, so I do like that. You know, some people were thinking ahead and noticing that the moisture content of oh, the soil is moist, so there must be some type of suction. Um, but especially in like silty or especially in sandy soils. That HC, that capillary action, is usually so short, you know, that we would just we would forget it and we would just assume that it's negligible. Mainly in heavy silt or clay soils, would we see a high capillary action? 
And again, in the for this class, it would always be stated like a capillary rise of four feet or whatever will be will be stated in a problem statement. So don't assume capillary rise if, if, unless it's stated. Okay, so um, I already showed this here, but again, we need to always consider the bulk unit weight. So for the bulk unit weight, we need to include the water. So if you're given a dry density and we know there's a moisture content, that means there's water in the pore space. So that means we need to include that in the density, the bulk density. So we need to turn that into a moist unit weight. And we found that that is 119 pounds per cubic foot. We have all the other ones saturated. This is the groundwater table here, right? And then we have our um, sand layer um, beneath that. So this is shown in depth. So that means that the thickness of each layer, we have this is 12 feet. This is 26 feet. And then this is 10 feet. So this is really crucial because if you mess up this step of simple subtraction, then all your stresses are gonna be off. So always do this first. You know, Sometimes it'll be given in elevation. Sometimes it'll be given in depth. When you, when you start working, you know, we usually always show it in an elevation because you're working with the contractors and, and, you know, the ground surface elevation or the ground surface can change. So the depth can change. So elevation is like a nice, like consistent value, but always make sure that you're recording the correct uh, heights or the correct thicknesses of the layers. Okay. So um, basically the, the main thing I wanted to go over for this one was at a depth of zero feet, this surcharge is still being felt. So that means at our ground surface, our total stress, if you were hanging out at the ground surface, you wouldn't have zero stress above you. You would have this 2000 PSF from the warehouse being applied at the surface. So that means our total stress at a depth of zero feet is still 2000 PSF. Now looking at the pore water pressure, how much standing water is above us? Well, the groundwater table is 12 feet below us. So right now we have no water above us. If this was you know, a lake, then we would have something, but since it's just you know, a dry uh, uh, 2000 PSF loading, then our pore water pressure is zero PSF. So this means our effective stress is 2000 PSF. you were to go to 12 feet down in depth. Then our stress at this point, we would still have that 2000 PSF from our loading above it, but we have another layer now on top of us and we have the unit weight of our silty sand, which is 119 pounds per cubic foot, times that height, which is 12 feet. So we always need to add consecutive amounts. It's like a dog pile. Like the deeper you go, the more stuff there is on top of you. So that stress is being applied. So our stresses should always increase with depth. You should never see the total stress increasing and then decreasing with depth. It will always be like a triangle shape. The deeper you go, the more stuff there is on top of you. So the higher that value is with depth. So make sure you're, you're checking that. Um, so with this, this would equal about 3, 4, 28 PSF. Again, the water at this point right here. If, if we're standing at 12 feet in depth, the amount of water above us is still zero since our height of water is zero, right? So this means our effective stress is still equal to our total stress. Hopefully you guys see it by now. Um, I'll just do this last one. That Z is equal to 38 feet in depth. So now our total stress, we have everything from before. So we have that 2000 PSF from our surcharge that's still being felt at that depth. We have our, our uh, silty sand layer. So 119 times 12 feet. And then we now also have this clay layer. So that's 119 pounds per cubic foot 
times the thickness of that clay layer, which is 26 feet. So again, always look at the thickness of the layer. Don't look at the total height from the, that point to above it. That H in this equation here is the thickness of that layer. So what we see from this is 6522 PSF. And now for our poor water pressure, since we're hanging out right down here, we have water above us. So our height of water above us, we have 26 feet of water above us. So our poor water pressure is 26 feet times the unit weight of water. So 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Make sure you have that value memorized. I'm sure a lot of you guys do by now, but 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And so what we have is about 1625, I'm sorry, 1622 pounds per square foot. So this means our effective stress at this layer is now 4900 SF, about that. And then you would do the same thing with the same layer underneath that. So you would add now the total stress at this point, but now you would add 121 times 10 feet and you would add to that. So again, what these should always look like, like it, your total stress, I'm not gonna be able to draw it completely, but please review those solutions I posted. They should always look like this. It should always be increasing. never come back towards, you're never having a like negative uh, stress. What you could have if you had like, let's just say there was a, a void or something right here, then what we would see is it would just be a straight line because we have no material adding right there, right? But it would never come back and then, you know, it could, it could go back that way. So, um, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, Okay. Oh, the value? Yeah. Well. Oh, right here? This one? Yeah. So since there is a moisture content, this is our dry unit weight. Oh, okay. So we need to correct that for the bulk unit weight, including the water in the pore space. Okay. So that's this step right here. So this equation is going to be really important. This, which is, this is the equation to calculate our dry unit weight. If you remember that from our, um, like our moisture content, optimal moisture content lab, it's just switched. So we now calculate for the moist unit weight. So yeah, this right here is the new bulk since there's water. Any other questions on it? Yeah, poor water pressure, the U. Uh, you add that to like, um, like a 38 or a 1622, so at 48 is plus. Yep. Um, so you could, you could use whatever technique you want. Like technically, you could think of it as just, okay, if I was down here now, how much water would be above me? You know, so now you have 20, 36 feet of water above you because for the poor water pressure, we don't care about the soil layers. Like just think of it as like, if all the soil was, was taken out, how much water would be sitting there if it was, you know, an empty swimming pool or something. Um, but you can, if, if it helps that way, you could do each one separately too. Um, but same with, with poor water pressure and total stress. Like as long, like, you know, think of a pool, like the deeper you go, the more water there is above you, the more pressure you have on your ears. So with, when you go with depth, the poor water pressure should always be higher. You know, the deeper you go, the, more, the underwater, the higher the poor water pressure should be. Okay, so yeah, super early. 
think over this more. If there's any questions on it, um, then let me know. But this, uh, this being able to determine the um, the total, the pore water pressure, and the effective stress is really, really important in geotechnical engineering, like for this class, for the final, but also moving forward, if you decide to go into a career of geotech or FE and PE and stuff, this stuff will definitely be on there. Um, the other one I wanted to review was um, problem three. Uh, this was kind of two parts. Um, problem 3B, the second part, was required a little bit of thinking, um, but I'll just go over the, the whole thing in general. Um, this problem is, is really like just a geotech application of like free body diagrams and statics. You know, so if we think back to our statics class, we're basically just looking at this, but in terms of stress instead of forces. Um, so what we're told is, uh, I don't, I should have wrote down the problem statement. I don't remember exactly, but there was, oh yeah, at what height should, or could this rise up to, this river water um, rise up to, and um, at what height would it cause blowout in this section here, I think, right? It was something like this, in this section of clay. So we have an excavation. That excavation is controlled, um, but during the flooding season, the poor water pressure at the base of this excavation will increase because the river water is increasing. So what we need to recognize with this problem is that this very pervious sand right here is causing an increase in poor water pressure due to this whole thing right here. So basically the pressure that is shown here, this height of water is equal to the pore water pressure right here. So just like the drawings where like, you know, we conceptually visualize like a, a straw coming out of like the soil tank and that's like the manometer, right? To show the head of pressure. That's basically what this river is telling us. This river is telling us the head or the total head, that pore water pressure, the, the pressure, sorry, the the, um, the pressure head of water that is acting in the pervious sand layer. So this pressure is technically everywhere here, but the place we care about is right here, this clay layer, since this is the thinnest. So if we were to actually zoom in at this clay layer, the excavation is set and we know that so let's just, this is all that clay chunk. We know that it has a thickness of 10 meters, right? Because this is the section that we care about right here. So this is a 10 meter section. Um, we know that it has a density of 2000 kilograms per cubic meter. And we know that there is a weight or a stress that this clay is applying, or that well, you know, it has a, a weight of clay. So let me not show it here. Let me show it inside. So due to the density of this clay, it is applying an effective stress. So just like in statics, like way back when, when we used to like look at free body diagrams and we, if we had a force in this direction and you know, like a weight in this direction and we did summation of forces in Y direction or equal to zero, um, you know, we could say like, when is, we are not in equilibrium anymore, when the force pushing on an object is greater than the weight in like a certain direction, you know, something like that. We're basically doing the same thing in this problem, but now we're looking in terms of stress instead of um, forces. So we have this stress that's in the Y direction. That is our unit weight of the clay. But what we also have is a pressure acting up in this direction from the pore water. And so this is that U. And we know the U is equal to the unit weight of water 
times the height of water. And we know that the stress from the clay is equal to the unit weight of clay times the height of clay. So the unit weight of the clay is given through the density, and then the, um, the height of the clay is also given since that's 10 meters. So what we can do is find this real quick. We know 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Since this is density, we need to multiply it by gravity to um, get the unit weight. So that's 9.81 meters, what is that, meters per second squared. And then we multiply this by the height of clay, which is 10 meters. So again, what we're doing basically here, right here, this is telling that our unit weight is equal to our density times gravity. The gravity coefficient. And then that H right here, this is our HC. What we see is our stress here is equal to 196.2 kilonewtons per meter squared. So again, what we're thinking about it here is just in terms of statics. Now in geotech, the way we simplify this is by looking at effective stress. So the effective stress represents that intergranule connection, right? So if we have an effective stress of zero, what does that mean? Like if we actually zoom in. What's happening with it when the effective stress is zero? Yeah, there's actually no connection point between it. So technically, we're in a non like, like we're not having gravity loads control. We're having like the soil floating almost, you know, in a clay. So in a clay scenario, this is bad because this is where blowout could occur. So Equation wise, how this looks is this is what happens when our total stress is equal to our poor water pressure, right? Because you just subtract or you add poor water pressure to both sides, and we have this there here. So, in this particular problem, this is going to be the critical layer point because when our total stress is less than our poor water pressure, when our poor water pressure is greater than our total stress, that means we have a disrupt disruption of equilibrium and this is going to cause the entire clay thing to move up and this is called heaving so luckily we can calculate all this the weight of the clay isn't isn't changing so this chunk is not changing in this problem the only thing that's changing is the poor water pressure. So we can determine a critical HW that will then cause our poor water pressure to be greater than our total stress, which would then in turn cause um, a compromisation of equilibrium and then movement heaving up. So how we would do this, we would literally just say, okay, like this is going to be the critical step that we care about. Like as soon as they are equal to each other, then that's when we start having heave. So if we know our total stress is 162 kilonewtons per meter squared, our poor water pressure is equal to the unit weight of water times the height of water. And we know that the unit weight of water is 62.4, sorry, not 62.4, we're in the wrong units here, 9.81 um, kilonewtons per cubic meter times the height of water, we can now solve for that height of water. And that height of water is the river right here. So what we want to see, what you need to recognize is where that datum is. So the height of water is staying right here. And I don't remember what exactly it asked, but basically we divide this 196.2 kilonewtons per square meter divided by 9.81 k 
kilonewtons per cubic meter. What we see is the kilonewtons cancel out, two of the meters squared cancel out with one of the meters squared. But since they're both in the denominator, we switch them. So the final unit is, should be 20-ish meters. So that means currently our river is at an elevation of 18 meters. If it rose two meters, then we would have this heave condition. So that's basically what we're, we're saying here. So the height H of W is 20 meters. So if the problem was asking how much would the river need to rise, this delta H W would be 18 minus or 20 minus 18. That would be, you know, two meters. I didn't ask that in this problem. I don't think did I? I don't think so. I think I just asked what the river elevation is. But in engineering terms, you know, this would be something that you would have to look for. You'd, you'd usually look at what would be the rise of the river um, instead of the actual elevation of it. Yeah. You asked what is the maximum elevation the water the river could rise to before the play at the bottom will begin to be. Okay, yeah. So 20, 20 meters, that's the maximum elevation. So if we go 20.1 meters, then that would make our pore water pressure greater than our total stress, which mean we would have heat. So that's where that value is coming from, that critical value of 20 meters. So a lot of times we can't control this kind of stuff, right? Like sometimes like, you know, floods are gonna happen. Um, summertime, the, there's gonna be more rain. So that's what the second problem was kind of asking. So in the second problem, um, what was it? It was saying that this river um, is planned to rise up to 30 meters, I think, right? I think that's what it was asking. 30 meters um, from the bottom of the clay. So we already know that this little thing would, wouldn't stand a chance, this little chunk of clay, right? Because we knew 20 meters is what's going to cause blowout. So at 30 meters, how can we reinforce this clay layer so that this heave doesn't occur? So if we are looking at just a simplified free body diagram, and we would have the pore water pressure in this direction, and then we would have the weight of the clay in this direction, but we can add some type of reinforcing such that when we do our little statics, that this reinforcing plus the total unit weight is going to match this pore water pressure and we don't have movement of that clay block moving up. So. So that your the goal is to calculate that anchor. Realistically, what they would do, they could use anchors like some type of um, tension anchors like this, where they actually drill into the sand and there it's like a tension for, um, uh, anchor in this way. What they could do is, you know, if if you weren't asked for anchors, they could actually install like concrete blocks down here. I mean, this is kind of you know, hopefully they build the foundation quick enough so that you don't have this heave. That's why in Florida, like, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but you're never supposed to let your pool drain out completely in Florida because the groundwater table is so high, the pool can actually raise out of the ground, you know? So like the poor water pressure, if the pool is empty and there's no weight of water in the pool, then the pool can just whoop, like pop out. It'll actually move everything out because it's like putting a beach ball under water, you know, it's going to want to rise. So that's why in construction like this, the stage would have to be quickly. They, they, they would have to either install some type of reinforcing down here, or they would have to start building the structure. So we add this weight, this extra weight, so it doesn't heave up. So in this particular problem, I was just taught, I just asked for reinforcing. So that would be like these anchors that would be going vertically into the pervious sand layer and cause uh, having some tension requirement so it doesn't uh, have the blow out there. Um, so what we would first have to do is calculate this new pore water pressure. So the pore water pressure when the HW is equal to 30 meters. So this new height of water is 30 meters now. So what we'd see, same equation as before. And this is equal to, 
yeah, 9.81 times 30 meters now, and that is 294.3 kilonewtons per cubic meter or per square meter. So this clay layer is not changing, this HC. So we found earlier, or we found from the previous, the sigma clay. So the stress of the clay is that 10 meters times that unit weight. We found that that is 196.2 kilonewtons per square meter. So that's not changing, right? We're not adding, and we're not compacting or densifying the clay, although that, that could technically be an option. For this specific case, we're doing anchors, we're leaving the clay layer alone. So um, again, what we're looking at here is we need this sigma, the total stress to be greater than the pore water pressure. So just looking at it just as is, HW is 30 meters. What we would have now is our effective stress would be still you know, equal to this equation here. But what we would see is we'd have 196.6 kilonewtons per square meter minus 294.3 kilonewtons per square meter. So our current effective stress is going to be equal to negative 91 point here, point one, I guess. So this negative is meaning what? Like, again, if we think about like the uh, uh, inner granule stress, our, our effective stress is the inner granule stress. If we have negative, that means they're being separated. So if, if we need to make that effective stress zero, that means we need to add 98.1 kilonewtons per square meter of some type of stress in the other direction. And that's where the anchors come in. So if we, we need these anchors to have a added stress of 98.1 kilonewtons per square meter. Now in the problem statement, or so what this would look like, again, like visualizing this in 3D world, And this is actually like a chunk of clay or whatever, or just a chunk of clay. This means we need to add a certain amount of pressure to this. We need to add 98.1 kilonewtons per square meter of pressure to this like block. And so the anchors in the problem statement are told that they are spaced out every five square meters. So like instead of like having just a net blanket of connection points, obviously we only can install certain ones every five square meters. So these anchors would be spaced out like this. And again, we're looking at a 3D world. So, you know, they're, they're spaced out. But if we have a stress of negative or if we have a stress of 98.1 kilonewtons per square meter, and we know that they are being spaced out every five square meters, then let's just visualize this as sorry, so this it wouldn't be five, but let's just say that this whole area here. are five square meters. And so we just have one anchor in the center. And what we're gonna do is just call this F. So how would we find the resultant force if we had 98.1 kilonewtons per square meter, how would we find the resultant like force or load from that? We would just multiply it by the area. Remember, stress is equal to force divided by area. We do stress 
times the area. I always say units, like hopefully you've recognized by now, like if we just saw that the units are kilonewtons per square meter, and we're also given a square meter, and we need kilonewtons, then you know how to change those units around and divide or multiply such that we have the answer in kilonewtons. So for this, the answer would be this F is 98.1 kilonewtons per square meter, which is the stress that the anchors need to hold, but the anchors are spaced at every five square meters. So each anchor needs to hold whatever this value is. So 491 kilonewtons. So that would be from the geotech side of thing. Then we would call our structural engineering friend and be like, hey, we need uh, anchor, you know, either concrete or some type of metal that is, has a tension, tensile strength or a certain like rupture strength of 491 kilonewtons. Can you, can you calculate this and can you provide like the cheapest option for this, you know, something like that. So this is like kind of like one of those real applications of it because uh, like we always analyze in stress, but a lot of times we are actually calculating or we're actually like, you know, constructing in forces like that. Any questions on this one? Okay. Um, yeah, as I said before, go over these again, review them. If it's still not making sense after coffee and after double digits time, you know, in the morning time, um, then let me know and I can go over it in more detail. All right, where we were with the stress distribution. Um, so we went over a lot of stuff. Uh, we were talking all these fun tables from your DOS textbook. Um, we went over point load, vertical line load, horizontal line load, vertical strip load, rectangular area, rectangular area for corner and center, and circular area. This is what we've gone over before. So this is kind of just like a, a broad thing, the equations and then the DOS table from that PDF. And again, the thing to look for in this case is the unit. So again, the point load is always going to be a force unit. So if a force is going to be pounds, or kilonewtons. Now this equation is always going to give us a delta sigma z. It's always gonna give us a stress, but the source is going to be, for, for a point load would be a pound or a kilonewton. For the line load, it would be force per length. Now same for this one, force per length. Vertical strip load, same. Uh, no, first strip is a force per like width, I guess. And then obviously these are stresses, so this would be, um, you know, a stress. So these would be sigmas, and what we show these sigmas as are Qs, All right? So Qs is like the surcharge at the surface. That's just the force divided by the area of the footing. So there's one other um, aspect or one other like type of loading that is really important and is really commonly used in geotechnical engineering. And that is the embankment shape. So especially in Florida, um, these things are all over the place. Levees, you know, they're basically keeping us from having flooding. Um, this is like one of the largest ones actually in the US is the Herbert Hoover uh, Dyke in Lake Okeechobee. Like, forever down away from us in Florida. Um, but if we look at uh, actually a cross section of this, what these are made out of soil, which is really nice because soil is cheaper than trying to install a massive concrete earth dam. Um, but what we see is that this has a very distinct shape, this embankment shape. Um, and uh, we, the reason why we construct it this way is because um, you know, we, if we did vertical lines, then the soil would, would fall over. So we need to have this angle here um, to allow the soil to, since it's a frictional, so it won't collapse in on itself. So on for earth dams and dikes and that kind of things, uh, this trapezoidal shape is really popular, but also we use this in um, transportation a lot too. So just driving around, you'll notice that the embankments, uh, you know, this is a screenshot from I-95 and 295 overpass. You can see that the embankment right here follows a certain shape, 
a trapezoid. So this type of shape is very commonly used in geotechnical engineering. So it would make sense that we need to find the loading and the increase of stress underneath this type of object or this type of you know uh, structure. So it's a little different from structural loading. Think about what we're doing when we're talking about structural loading. Um, we have a column that is applied over a cross-sectional area. And this cross-sectional area is then causing a stress. And I said before we show that stress when it's a structural stress and this thing is frozen, we show this as a Q, which is equal to the cross or the load, you know, in pounds or in kips or in kilonewtons divided by the area, right? We, we know that by now. Now for this case, for an embankment load, we have something that looks like this. And again, this is in the little 3D world of it. Um, but the stress applied is not from a structure. Like we could have, you know, traffic loading up here and stuff. But the majority of the stress is applied from the density, right? So this would be a function of the soil density here. So this would be the compaction and everything. So this Q is a little bit harder to find. It's not just the load coming from our structural engineering friends. Like this is the, based off of the compaction and based off of the height of how much the soil is underneath us. So um, how they devised this was we took just like a little strip, a little cross section of this. So you cut like a one meter or one foot section of our embankment. Um, and so this is, yeah, a little cross section of it. The stress applied, again, what we're gonna say is it is this Q value, but now this is the unit weight of the soil times the height of this. So this increase of stress due to loading is again, what we show this as is Delta Sigma Z. But the way that the math checked out using Boussinesque's is under the center, what we would do if this is at a depth of Z is actually cut this thing in half. So the analysis is always with half of an embankment. So this is really important because the, all the math and all the Boussinesque equation, this table, when we find a delta sigma Z, and if you look in your textbook, it looks something like this. This is only for half of the embankment. A lot of times though, you don't just have the soil ending with a straight line right here, right? There's a whole nother half of symmetry. So we need to account for that by multiplying it by two. But this is what the Boussinesse equation is derived off of. So it's the analysis of a half embankment. Um, just as before, they use a really fun mathematical equation or analytical um, equation here. It's a function of these two angles the height, there, sorry, yeah, the height for the Q naught, but then these widths there. And thanks to geometry, we can, of course, simplify this um, to just an influence value. So if you look in your textbook, this is I2, um, delta sigma Z is equal to this, this I2 value. Um, this is in figure um, 10.5, which I'll show here. But again, what this is technically for, this is only for half an embankment. So if we care about the full symmetry or the full embankment, and this is a symmetrical object, um, then what we would need to do is multiply this. So this Delta Sigma Z, I'm just going to say actual is equal to two times the Delta Sigma Z analysis. This is really important. For whatever reason, the textbooks and the equations all check out, but only for half of it. So we need to add on for um, that second half. So the tables um, are a little bit crazier. So what I'm just going to show is the nomograph of how to read this here. So again, this is for the edge of half of an embankment. So this is directly under the center of the full embankment or edge of the half, and it's always going to be under the tallest section. So it's not under the edge over here. It's not this, we'll cover that here in a second. This is only for under the center of the hole or under the edge of the half, the tallest edge of the half there. So what this 
um, I value is, if we look at the chart here, we see it's a function of B2 divided by Z, where B2 is our sloping length right here. So B2 is the one that is sloped. And it's also a function of um, B1 divided by Z. And the B1 is the, the flat length, or the, fat, uh, the flat widths. So these I values here on the Y axis, this is our I2 value. So if we have, um, you know, something, you know, this is in log scale, you notice that. So what we do is if we had a B2 divided by Z right here and a B1 divided by Z of let's just say like 0.1 or something. So this is the one we care about. And just like before, how we do this is we start here. You take a ruler or something that's not a hand using a, wherever this would intercept, then you read over, and then this would be your, your I value, you know, same as we read before. So the important thing to, to note for this is make sure you're using the correct B1 and B2. Um, these are only the widths. Sometimes you might be given the entire width you know, something like this, you might be given a, a W like this, and then you need to actually calculate the B1 and B2 based off of the geometry or something like that. So make sure you, you keep an eye out for that. So let's just look at a, a brief example here. Um, what is the increase of stress, the delta sigma Z at six meters below the center of the embankment? We're gonna assume the average density of the soil is two megagrams per cubic meter. Um, and what we should first recognize is that this is a whole embankment, right? So we care about both sides. So the analysis is half. So at the very end, we're going to need to multiply our analysis value by two, since we have two sides that we're measuring. So this example here, we're given our B1, right? This would be, oops, this would be our B1. So we're given that value. Our B2 is this value right here. You can see we're not given that, we're given the height at three meters and we're given the slope. So what this slope is telling us is that for every one meter we go up, we go over two meters. So that means if we go, if it was only one meter high, we would have two meters in width, which means if it was two meters high, we would have four meters in width. So if it was three meters high, then we would have six meters in width. So we find this B2 to be six meters from that. So right, this is shown a lot. This is used a lot in the FE and in the PE, you know, just showing this slope. So make sure you understand like how to, to read that, you know, what that little two to one slope is telling you. Um, so for our soil information, our density is two megagrams per cubic meter. Um, since we're in SI units, this means we have to, to find our unit weight. We have to multiply this density times gravity. Um, so doing that, again, gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. We see that it is 19.6 megagrams per meter squared times second squared. This is kind of the issue where um, luckily this all checks out to um, kilonewtons per cubic meter. So that's why we, you know, a kilonewton is a um, milli or gram per meter squared per second squared. I don't remember. SI is kind of tricky sometimes. Um, what is it? One newton. equal to, what is it, one kilogram per meter per second squared. Um, and then so one kilonewton is equal to one megagram per meter per second squared. So yeah, all of this is set to show that the density is 19.6 kilonewtons per meter cubed. 
So remember the Q is equal to the density of the soil times the height. So our Q in this case is 19.6 kilonewtons per cubic meter times our height, which is three meters. So our Q is 58.8 kilonewton per square meter. So what we need to find um, is our geometry terms now. So we can use our figure 10.15 to find our influence factor. So our B2 divided by our Z, our Z is six meters. So B2 divided by Z, our B2 is six. So six divided by six, this is nice because that is one. Our B1 divided by Z is five divided by six, which is not as nice. It is 0.83. All right, so knowing that we look at our fancy cool little chart. Um, our B2 divided by Z was one, our B1 divided by Z is 0.83. Our X axis is B2 divided by Z. So one is nice and easy. Our B1 divided by Z are these contour lines here, these blue lines. So we're going to be somewhere between 0.8. We're gonna be somewhere between this line and this line. And this is where the accuracy of geotech comes in. I'm just going to say it's going to be somewhere in between that. Because again, these charts are just kind of messy as they are. So we'd read this all the way up using an actual straight line somewhere in between that, closer to the 0.83 side. And then we would read it directly over. So make sure. You, you read, you know, it's a 90 degree change here. So something like that. It's gonna, it looks tricky if you, you need to use a straight edge because you don't wanna accidentally follow the contour in. It's a 90 degrees bounce off of that point. So picture like whatever this point is, you have like a wall here that you just throw ping pong at and it that bounces off 90 degrees. All right. so. Um, the um, increase of stress here is this I value. So what we're going to say is that this I value here, according to our chart, is about, what did I say, just to keep it consistent, 0 0.44. 0 0.44. So this means our Q, well, from, from before, our Q was 58.8 kilonewtons per square meter. So our delta sigma Z is going to equal 26.0 kilonewtons per square meter. So again, though, that this is only half. Don't forget to do that. After all this analysis, we recognize that at the beginning, don't forget to multiply it by two. So what this whole analysis is based on is half of the embankment. So in order to get the full embankment, need to multiply by two, two X. This means our actual delta sigma Z is equal to 26 times two or 52 kilonewtons per square meter. If if the bottom, so it technically what this is like if you want an equation, this would be two divided by one. Yeah. Because the slope like, is two to one. If the slope was two to three, then you would you wouldn't be able to just multiply it by two. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if you if you want an equation, I think it's just easier to think of it like you know physically, like this is you know draw in a grid if you need to up one over two, up one over two, up one over two. That's six. Um, yeah. You know, but if it was like up two over three, up two, you know, do something like that, or it would be at two divided by one. So the yeah. the run over the rise. You never give it as a percent slope. Um, I would never do it, but yeah, like that some people would <laughs> like the, uh, um, I mean, contractors and stuff like that, they, they like to show it in percentage, which would just be, yeah, the, I mean, you, you could either show it in degrees or, or like the grade, like kind of like a roadway grade and stuff, especially in transportation, but yeah. Um, but FE and the PE we always show it that way, like, you know, a, a rise over run little triangle or something. All right, um, cool. Okay, so uh, let's look at this other example here. Sometimes it might not be an exact uh, trapezoid. You know, we could like have a pyramid, like if we wanted to figure out the increase of stress due to the Giza pyramids or something, we'd actually use the same equation. But now in this case, um, the B2, you know, we're given is our B1 would just be zero meters. So in this example, like if our Z here, we still wanted to know at six meters, we would have this. Um, our Q would be the same, our delta H or gamma times our H, and our H is three meters. Um, so if we would look at our figure here, you would see that now we would use this contour right here. So this lower contour of B1 divided by Z is equal to zero. You know, you could just picture this as like the triangle contour or something where we actually don't have this trapezoidal shape. We're only looking at it underneath a center of it. So this would, um, let's just show this out real quick. So point one here. Um, so you would read this up to wherever it intersects here. And then over something like this. What you see is about four. So then our is going to be same as before. If we have this same density. But now our influence value is smaller, so 0.24 delta 6 equal to 14.1. So this type of triangular analysis uh, is it comes into play uh, a lot because all of the analysis for the embankment that we were just talking about was under the center of the embankment, right? So directly under the center. Um, but just as before, like what would happen if we needed to find the increase of stress along the outside or something like if there was, you know, a tunnel or something here at this point along the cor corner of our footing. Um, so to do that, we need to use superposition just like we did with the rectangular stuff. So we add on a fake amount of area and then we subtract that off. So we find the increase of strength or increase of stress due to a fake area, and then we end up subtracting that off for the analysis. Because remember, this whole analysis is based off of this shape. So it has to be under the edge of the tallest end. So what we could actually do to find this delta sigma z along the corner is we can pretend that this is a much larger half embankment. So we can actually add on a fake area here and just assume that this is all soil. And now, now we have a larger half embankment with a new B1 and a new B2. So we have, I'm just gonna say it equals this. It looks like this now large super embankment. And then what we would do is we could just subtract out that extra triangle that we added. Because remember, the point that we care about here is right here under the corner. 
So now everything is under this corner and our analysis would work out. So we have this now super embankment, this fake super embankment, and we subtract out that little triangle that we added since that the point that we care about is still underneath that triangle. So this is something where then you would have to, you know, think about the delta sigma z actual is equal to, you know, delta sigma z one minus the delta sigma z two. So where this would be our one, and then this would be that fake two. So we subtract this out. So I always think like the analysis is for half. So in this case, we actually don't need to multiply anything by two because we're all still looking at it as if it's half of the embankment. There's not an actual second thing on this side. So you wouldn't multiply this by two. <clears throat> so if we wanted to find a point like right here, for example, then you wouldn't do this technique because that's way too difficult. You would, you would do a numerical model or some other type of analysis um, because Boussinex equation, you would have to divide this thing up way too much and it, it wouldn't be you know, computationally effective. You, you'd lose all your accuracy and there wasn't much accuracy to begin with. So really this technique is only used for the edge of the embankments or the center of the embankment where we can like divide it up into these triangles like that, this. So if you have a problem like this, I don't have enough time to go over an example problem. Just make sure you change this new width, right? So now this would be our new B1, and then this would be the B2. Remember, originally, you're given this. So this is not the B1 for your analysis anymore. You need this new B1 since we're adding on this, this new area. Does that make sense? All right, cool. Um, there's one more technique I want to talk about. Um, and this is a very, very rough, again, analytical technique. Um, but we're talking about irregular shapes off center. So like if we are looking at, if you're you know, a bird flying over a project site and you see this is the new house foundation or warehouse foundation, structure foundation or something, um, how would we find the increase of stress at this point that's off center or off the edge of this uniform loaded area? So again, this is looking down on the screen. Um, you could do a bunch of different ways. You, since this is all rectangles, you could do a bunch of equations to find the corners here and all that pain, subtract these out and, and the stuff that we talked about in the last class. Um, but it's really difficult to divide up, right? So in general, we know that this delta sigma z is equal to some, or the Q, so the stress times some influence factor, this I value. This is like the generalized formula that we've been working up, right? right? So what this dude did in the 40s, um, I forgot his first name, but something new mark. He looks like a Edward, maybe Edward Newmark. He actually almost kind of looks like Danny DeVito, like an like from Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and just always like before he got scary and stuff. Um, but what he did was actually devised a, a graphical method. And so this is a graphical method to determine influence. And this influence is used for any shape foundation or you know bearing area. So this is super nice because what if we had you know like a, a, a pool, a swimming pool that was a bunch of curves and stuff? How could we find the pressure from that? We couldn't divide it into rectangles using Boussinesques. We're going to have to like, you know, do some other things. So he still uses Boussinesse, but he devised this as a graphical method. The graphical method looks really trippy, but this is his new mark chart right here. It looks like a massive spider web or a tunnel that you're going into. Um, I don't advise like 
if you've been studying for more than six hours or seven hours, don't look at this because you'll just like trip out and get you know stuck in a <laughs> in a loophole or something. Um, but what this chart does is this provides us the influence factor um, in that equation. So um, what the first thing is important is that we need to set a scale. So each one of these charts has a scale right here. So this scale is going to be how we change our, um, like place our footing size on this. So the scale is needed for the depth. So to set the scale first, so let's say we need a depth of, um, let's say, I mean, we're given like a, a cross-sectional area like this. The point we care about is this point O. The point we care about is the very center of the chart. So how would we plot this area on this chart? If we have, um, well, the depth is, is how we set that scale. So this point AB down here is going to be equal to the depth of our interest. So let's just say that we need to find the increase of stress at point O, o, o dash or whatever, at a depth of 60 feet. That would mean that this area from point, or this length from A to B is going to equal 60 feet. So this would be used on like CAD or, or something, or you would just have to like roughly estimate it. But you would then scale this entire shape such that this, you know, 60 foot dimension is equal to this length on the chart right here. So obviously drawing that by hand is not practical, but if you had like a CAD, like AutoCAD or some type of software, you could just scale the entire thing up or lower. So what we would do then is once we have that object scaled, we would plot that on the new mark chart. And then that number of cells that are covered in this scale area. So in this entire thing right here, the number of cells that are covered multiplied by the influence factor of the chart is that IV value or is that influence factor. So what you would need, I mean, for this, let's just zoom in and see it here. So how would we count? How are, how are the number of scale cells that are covered here? Like, obviously we have the full squares that are covered. Then you have a bunch of these like little partial squares. So you would actually have to go and try to estimate and find which ones are actually covered. So, you know, you would say like, okay, this is one here. So we'll count this as one. This is another one here, this whole three. So super accurate stuff, right? You could probably say like, okay, this is one right here. But at the end of the day, what you would say is, all right, you got it. That like, okay, the total number of cells covered is about 32. So using this technique, if we had 32 cells covered, about 32, this would mean that our Delta Sigma Z from this shape is Q, which is our uniform load of 20, 250 kPa, times the influence factor of our chart. So there's a bunch of different charts out there with different influence factors. And then times the number of cells covered, so 32. So this, all of this is equal to about 40 kPa. Uh, nope, it, there's different charts out there, but it'll always be given to you. So the charts are going to be like, you know, the tunnel is going to be tighter or, or skinnier or something. Um, believe it or not, though, I think this, this was a question when I took the FE. This was a question. They already have it plotted. You just have to count and estimate it. But of course, this is super, you know, like no one's going to actually count the exact number of cells that are covered in this. So this at least provides a quick estimate if you need to do something and analyze like the increase of stress and you only have like a, a few hours to turn around and you don't want to like go through the whole boost and nest, you know, you can use this graphical solution to at least get a rough estimate of, of that. So this is still used in industry, but then, you know, it's for that quick initial preliminary analysis. That's up there. You go. So this was given to us Z. So this is the depth that we care to find this Delta Sigma Z. Yeah. Why did I scale right here? So that's part of using the graph actually. So 
all like when you have a new mark chart you're always going to be given the influence factor and then you're always going to be given this scale and that scale on the chart is going to be the depth that you care about so if this was 40 feet if we cared about 40 feet then this thing would be scaled for 40 feet so it would be a little bit larger you know it would be like a little bit larger so the shallower it is 10 feet you know we would expect this thing to be larger because the scale is different is that is that answer a little bit the the reference dimension like either meter or feet or something no, or so this is the distance here so so we're given a dimension of the the figure so if this is this section is 60 feet or 60 meters then we would want like an easy thing would just be to scale this entire thing so that this is the same width as that or same length as that well it, it'd be based off of what you're given so the z value so if the z is 60 feet then you need to scale it to 60 feet yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah because this is part of the problem this is where you need to find the increase of stress so this is telling us delta sigma z at 60 feet this is what we need to find so that's where that comes from okay so new mark chart super sketchy all of these things super sketchy there's the old saying Everyone says the A in geotech stands for accuracy. So just again, like all of this stuff is meant for like preliminary analysis and it's all gonna be dependent on what type of project you're working on. Um, so what, what I'll talk about before the exam review are some of the actual like field val validation techniques, some of the sensing that we actually do in soil to verify that all of this fun math that we're assume, assuming is actually taking place in the field. Um, so that's a super important step. This is the summary of what we know so far for the stress distributions under the area. So again, this is all to find the delta sigma z, but for super important projects, we'll actually still install sensors at certain depths and be able to determine and measure the actual increase of stress from the loading um, as we are constructing our structure or whatever to verify that that is actually correct. Again, this, think about long-term. All of these construction projects are long-term. We're not just like, bringing a building and putting a building there. So we're installing it in stages and we can monitor and measure that increase of stress to make sure we're not exceeding the, the strength values or anything. Um, any questions before we go? Sorry, it's a little late. All right, cool. I'll see you guys on Thursday. And um, yeah, good luck this week. We're almost done. Let me know if there's any questions or concerns on this stuff. I'd be happy to cover it. Legacy engineer. Um, I I haven't, um, but 